The Ultrasound Leadership Academy is a nonprofit that's here to disseminate ultrasound knowledge via what's essentially an online ultrasound fellowship. For those who can't be somewhere else for an extra one to two years, they have a busy schedule, they already have a set career, and they can't really go back and do training. This is what this is for. And what we want to do is we want to be able to spread the ultrasound goodness broadly. We have a multitude of professors spanning a multitude of different specialties, critical care, emergency medicine, family medicine, uh, sports medicine, anesthesia. We have all of them available to teach us, do these one-on-one -on -one hangouts. And every month or so, we have a Grand Rounds. And this week, I wanna show you one that one of our professors, Dr. Terrence Rod, who's a critical care physician, as well as an EM physician, as well as an ultrasound-trained physician. He's like three types of doctors in one. He is gonna to talk to us about ultrasound and cardiac arrest. Check it out. All right, well, um, we're talking about ultrasound and cardiac arrest, uh, which is pretty, uh, it's making its way, you know, in different fields, pre-hospital, in the emergency department, inpatient. And, you know, to be honest, it doesn't have that much validation. Uh, and we'll, we won't talk about that much of the data to support it because there's not really that much hard evidence. But I think that really doesn't matter when you apply ultrasound and cardiac arrest and you make some of these like crucial saves um, and you'll be a believer, I think, for the rest of your career. Uh, so we'll kind of go through some of the technicalities. Uh, sorry. We'll go through some of the technicalities, you know, how to do ultrasound and cardiac arrest, what not to do, how we can avoid potential harm. And also because this comes up a lot, what is the prognosis? How much does ultrasound, your finding is an ultrasound, tell you what you should do about maybe terminating the code or maybe continuing the code? And that comes up a lot, so we're, we'll go over a little bit of the data on that. Okay, so getting into the technicalities. When it comes to probe selection, really we're gonna be using curvilinear or phased array probe. I don't think there's really a right or wrong answer to this. You know, your curvilinear is gonna help you look at that belly, maybe for some free fluid on the off chance you find something. The phased array probe is, of course, is gonna help you get in between the rib spaces. Both of, the, both of them are gonna be able to help you find what you need, uh, especially at the heart. So whatever you have in your hand is kind of my answer. Now, what are we actually looking at? And of course, the big one is the heart. But I don't wanna underplay uh, the significance of looking at the lungs, and we'll see what we look at, looking at the abdomen, and also the veins and arteries, not just for vascular access, but I believe that doing a little bit of assessment of the veins um, can kind of play into your decision to maybe do something like thrombolytics. So <clears throat> the view, really it's gonna be the sub xiphoid view is gonna be your best view. You're gonna to wanna to try and get this view prior to rhythm check, chest compressions are going on, you got the Lucas device going or however you, know, you do it, and you're gonna try and get the best view you have. Now inevitably, everything's bouncing around. And you may only get a fraction of a view at that you know moment. But if you have an idea of where you want to be or if you're a probe, you're going to have a much better chance of getting that view once the pulse check occurs. Now, I also say sub xiphoid because one, you're out of the way of chest compressions, right? You're going to need to put that gel on your probe. You don't want that gel sliding around, making some, you know, someone doing chest compressions, flying off the chest. And it also is really sensitive for pericardial effusion. Now, we know that if you're not in the way, you're not doing a parasternal view, you're going to allow those chest compressions to resume immediately. Now, inevitably, we know uh, after your 10 second pulse check, inevitably we know that, uh, or everyone in the room typically knows that you wanna resume chest compressions within 10 seconds, but there's always this hesitancy to kind of resume if you're actively doing something in the personal. So I'm gonna say the sub xiphoid. My next is gonna be the apical four. And that's if the sub xiphoid view isn't really getting me what I want. Now, <clears throat> of course, I do think this, the sub xiphoid view has kind of the downside of it's easy to distort the RV and misdiagnose chamber size. It's really easy to change that view. But of course, I'm not, we're, we'll see how RV chamber size really plays into how we manage cardiac arrest patients. The parasternal, 
as I said, it's not really my go-to. I try to avoid it if I can. And of course, if you can stick the probe down the esophagus, that's going to be all the ultimate view. Um, but of course, we know that's not available everywhere. So some of the other technicalities, we really want to limit the number of exams. Uh, really, if, especially if you're the only provider um, and you, you're not at like the University of Kentucky where like residents come out of the woodwork for every single code, you're going to want to also be focusing on everything else you're supposed to be doing. So limiting the number of exams and making the exams as useful as possible, I think is um, the right idea. And so typically I get the room situated, you know, get the room nice and quiet, have our chest compressions going, look for something I might have to do immediately, whether it's an airway or airway management. And then I usually, once things are settled, maybe on the second or third pulse check is usually when I get to my first ultrasound. And that's just a logistics thing. Uh, <clears throat> you know, and then at that point, I'm really only adding ultrasound again um, when I see some kind of change. Maybe the end tidal CO2 goes up. I want to see is that heart squeezing better or I have a change in the rhythm. We were in V-fib, 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 and now I'm not so sure. And we'll look at that a little bit more. And we're also going to want to save clips. And this has been great. This is this is honestly a game changer, changer because we see times when you put that probe on and you're not really sure what you're looking at. So you hit save clip immediately. And then that way chest compressions resume. You get to look at that clip and say, hey, that wasn't asystole. That was V-fib. I can see that clearly now. And you, you get to make that kind of change. So we really only, I really only do it when we get these dynamic changes, such as a rhythm change or a change in entitled CO2 or something else that, that really promo, provokes me to make an intervention. So it's not a cardiac arrest talk without um, talking about the H's and T's. And of course, um, I think as most, pro, you know, cardiac arrest providers, we intuitively kind of go through these and we're going to see how ultrasound can help identify these reversible causes. So um, clearly does ultrasound diagnose hypoxia and acidosis? Not really. We're not quite at the point where it diagnoses uh, potassium of 9.8, not yet at least. Um, so really what that leaves us is kind of a few specific things that ultrasound is going to aid us in the diagnosis. And I like that too, because then it, it gives us a, a target, a binary target, and then we move on so that we can focus on other things. So we're going to assess for hypovolemia, tamponade, tension pneumos, and the need for thrombosis. And that, over the next couple of slides here, we're going to kind of look at where in my opinion, um, we have the highest level of confidence of intervention and then kind of where we get into some very gray areas. And so, of course, I would love to hear your all's opinion <clears throat> and maybe how you like to do things. So if we start with something that I feel pretty confident, we have a cardiac arrest patient come in. It's going to be the for the evaluation of tension pneumothorax. Now, um, granted, I'm probably not the best at the physical exam, but... In cardiac arrest, I actually do a physical exam. And of course, it's not like, can you uh, lift your arms up? I'm looking for, again, specific things. So, you know, I, for example, um, I feel for AV fistulas in my cardiac arrest. I look because in my mind, you know, that increases the chance that maybe this is dialysis player and they need um, calcium chloride or something like that. But one of the other things I look for is I put my hands on the bilateral chest and I feel for crepitus. And for me, if I have crepitus in one side of the chest, that's a done deal. I'm going to assume that person has a tension pneumothorax or at least a pneumothorax and is contributing to their persistent arrest. So if I feel crepitus on the chest, I'm usually putting in a chest tube. I can't think of a time I'm not putting in a chest tube. Um, but that's kind of like a lucky finding, so to speak, because it's rare. It will happen, but I can't really count on it. So, of course, that's when ultrasound comes into play. Now, I think ideally the most optimal time to do this is during a pulse check. You need to kind of prep your respiratory therapist or whoever's bagging or if a patient's on a vent, et cetera. You're going to want to say, hey, during this next pulse check, I'm going to be using the ultrasound to look for a pneumothorax. Can you bag a couple times? Now, we know if the lungs are perfectly still and there's no respiratory effort at all, it's going to be really difficult to see that lung sliding. And um, so, you know, if you do, 
on, for example, on the left, we see an awesome lung point. Again, that's going to be a done deal. I'm putting in a chest tube on that side. I'm doing it quickly and moving on to the next problem. Now, the other kind of nice thing about chest compressions, is a weird way to say it, is that often it causes some pulmonary contusions. And so we might see something like felines, um, which of course rule out pneumothorax. So even if you don't get great view of sliding, but you see good B lines, maybe caused by pulmonary contusions and chest compressions, you know that there's no pneumothorax. But ultimately, this is a pretty high level of confidence. If I don't see sliding, or especially if I see a lung point, I'm gonna put in a chest tube and a cardiac arrest. I'm gonna just make that assumption that it's somehow, if not the cause, contributing to their cardiac arrest. So the next thing that I feel pretty confident about in cardiac arrest is uh, the evaluation of pericardial effusion, whether or not it's tamponade, and what I'm going to do about it. So in the setting of cardiac arrest, like, yeah, there's a lot of people that come to the ER or in the hospital that have pericardial effusions that die of other reasons. But if someone just shows up and you don't know anything about them, you put the probe in the sub xiphoid view and you see an effusion, I am making the assumption that it has come, it has caused their cardiac arrest. So just about any cardiac arrest that I find a pericardial effusion in, I'm just going to drain it. And, you know, I love talking about tamponade, you know, mitral inflow velocity variation, all these different findings that we find in cardiac arrest and uh and in ultrasound and the diagnosis but of course i'm not doing any of that for me it's pretty much binary it's is there an effusion and is the patient dead then i'm going to just drain it i'm going to take it off the table uh maybe in some nuanced situation i could somehow persuade myself out of it but i haven't come across that uh encounter yet so these two pneumothorax pericardial effusion, those two I'm pretty much set in stone. I'm intervening on those very quickly uh, as an assumption that is contributing to their arrest. The next one, which is a little bit more gray, is kind of how we approach the diagnosis of pulmonary embolism and the need for thrombolytics. <clears throat> so, you know, to have a pulmonary embolism that causes cardiac arrest, by definition, that's a massive PE. And of importance, I think it's really, as we go through the next slides, I think it's really important to note, to die of a PE, I really think you need RV failure. I don't know how you, you know, go into shock and cardiac arrest if your RV hasn't failed from the PE. And, you know, theoretically, if there were some that had a PE and their RV was doing great and they died, maybe they died of something else, like an arrhythmia or something along those lines. So, again, we're going to kind of tackle the, the confidence of intervention and the in intervention being TPA and uh, kind of break down our flow, our, our flow diagram of when we're going to interview and how confident we're going to feel about it. <clears throat> So here's a great example. Uh, we got this little roly poly here hanging out in the right atrium. It's just like teasing the right ventricle. That is a clot in transit. This, this is going to get <clears throat> TPA every single time. Um, without some other like, you know, brain surgery 24 hours later. I don't, I don't know. It's going to get TPA every single time. And that's because I have confidence that this clot in transit equates to a, you know, very high risk that the patient's already suffered a massive PE and cardiac arrest. But I'm going to focus on this example a little bit more because we also see other signs of RV failure. We see a McConnell sign, right? We see RV dilation and we see a visually, we see a depressed tapsy. That tapsy cannot be more than a centimeter. So again, we're seeing signs of RV failure, uh, which is important. And we'll, we'll see more on that in a couple slides. So we said we're going to TPA it. Here's another look at little caterpillar hanging out in the right atrium. It's going to make its way in. It's just like one second away from, uh, you know, finalizing this code. So again, any kind of clot in transit, um, if you find it, I'm going to give TPA. And of course, this isn't a talk on, you know, how much TPA over what. And if you're going to do TPA, how long you should continue the code, probably 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, that's all, you know, not part of this talk. But the answer is I'm giving it. <clears throat> 
So let's take a next step where we don't necessarily have the same level of confidence as a clot in transit. So on the left here, we see uh, a dilated RV, we see a McConnell sign, and we see a uh, visually depressed Tapsy. So I know all of these things say that this RV is not doing that great. Now this is when your venous assessment comes into play. So if I see a dilated RV, and then on the right, I do a quick FAM uh, ultrasound and I see non-compressible uh, femoral vein. So now I have RV failure and I have evidence of thrombosis. Like I already know this patient is at a high thrombogenic risk. Um, for me, that's good enough. In cardiac arrest, for someone who's otherwise going to die and stay dead, I'm going to use TPA in this situation. That combination. What data do I have to support this? Like none. It's fine. Practice variation exists, but for me, this is good enough. So let's move on to um, maybe a little bit lower level of confidence, and that's when I have isolated DVTs. And so what's not what's implicit in this slide is that I also have to do my ultrasound there in PEA or something like that, and the heart, the RV, for whatever reason, does not look dilated. So if I only have evidence of thrombosis, i.e. a DVT, but the RV, for whatever reason, has not failed, I think it's really hard to connect those two to say that this person suffered a massive PE. So I'm mostly going to say that's not good enough for me. I'm not adding TPA. Probably not. So now the next, next level, clot in transit, evidence of thrombosis and RV failure, to just evidence of thrombosis, probably not. The next one is, what if we have just RV failure? So again, we have this heart, we see the right side, it's dilated, McConnell's, poor Tapsy. I'm concerned about this heart. So the big question is, am I gonna push TPA in a patient that just has RV failure in cardiac arrest? And well, the good news is somewhere around 24 pigs have given their lives to help answer this question. And it was actually only recently, it's a lot more than 24 pigs. The same study group has looked at the same question in multiple different ways and essentially found the same thing. I'll go over one of the studies and one of the ways <clears throat> that they tried to help answer this question. So this was from 2016. It was trying to test the hypothesis that the right ventricle dilates only in the setting of PE versus other causes of arrest. So they induced a PE, right? They clamped that PA. And then they also compared it with cardiac arrest induced by hypoxia and then cardiac arrest induced by primary arrhythmia. So three different prongs and they looked at what the RV did. 24 pigs, thank you. Um, so what they found and what this is, is our different causes of arrest over time. And on our uh, vertical axis, we see the right ventricular diameter. So basically, no matter what the cause of arrest was, we see that that RV very quickly dilates. And for the most part, our confidence intervals overlap. So whether or not it was a PE or primary arrhythmia or hypoxia, we see that the RV dilates no matter what. Now, again, when I looked at this study, it turns out the same study group has done this in different causes of rest, not just these three, but they've looked at other causes too and found similar findings. Now, you know, you can say, you can look at the data a little bit more granular and they say when it was a PE, you know, at minute, uh, at exactly at minute four, you know, was the PE a little bit more dilated than hypoxia? Like, sure, but how does that help us? Clinically, I think not at all. This is the end diastolic eccentricity index is essentially a measurement of your D sign. And they see that, yeah, PE maybe at certain time points has a little bit more of a D sign. But if both hypoxia uh, and PE cause a D sign, it really doesn't aid us that much. So how does that play into like our overall scheme of ultrasound, cardiac arrest, pushing TPA? Well, if we have a clot in transit, I'm going to push TPA. If I have RV failure and evidence of thrombosis, I'm pushing TPA. Now, if I have just RV failure, I said maybe, maybe not. We have data to show us that, you know, uh, all sorts of things cause RV failure and cardiac arrest. So I need something else like high pretest probability. They have cancer. Or, or something along those lines. They already had a clot. Um, then I'm probably going to push TPA. 
And if I have DVT and a high pretest probability, maybe I'll push TPA. But ultimately, it kind of kind of plays into how we already approach TPA and cardiac arrest, where your pretest probability is going to play into that decision to push TPA. So we have this spectrum. It's definitely one of the more gray areas. So we've gone over tension pneumothorax, tamponade, uh, thr one half of thrombosis. Our other half of thrombosis, of course, is uh, MI. And this is really interesting. Um, so granted, I don't know if anyone's, I mean, if you have, if you've captured a wall motion abnormality in cardiac arrest, uh, send it to me. Cause I want to see that. That's cool. That's not easy to do. Obviously here's a great, <laughs> this is TEE in an alive person showing a very obvious wall motion abnormality. But the question is, what would you do with this in cardiac arrest? And I think ultimately the data is super gray. Even if you have a STEMI and you go into cardiac arrest, the guy, like AHA guidelines don't have a comment on whether or not you should push TPA, which is really kind of bizarre the more you think about it. So we don't have any guidelines to support us. I think it'd be hard to make confirm this diagnosis. So I can't really comment on that one way or the other. Now, the last one. Um, <clears throat> Darren, sorry. Yeah. My bad. I'm interrupting. I um, Anecdotally, like one of the things that the uh, WMAs will help with um, in my experience is communicating with the um, cardiologist. So I've had situations where we have patients like, like we can't get out of VTAC basically. Um, so we're doing continuous stuff. We see a regional wall motion abnormality. I mean, it's, it's hard to get an EKG in arrest, right? Like it's uh, impossible to get an EKG yeah. in arrest. We have this thing. I show to the cardiologist like, oh, okay, let's take them up to the cath lab. I mean, that's very cardiologist dependent, uh, mm -hmm. but that's one situation in which that that's like, why I do it is because sometimes that might be enough to push the cardiologist basically to do an intervention on someone who otherwise they might not want to. Yeah. And maybe, and maybe that's, maybe that's a push for, um, ECMO cannulation or something like that. Yeah. Um, right. it's, it's tough. And I think that's going to be a kind of like a case by case potential case series publication. Um, it's an interesting topic, but and you're going to see a lot of practice variation. Um, yeah, one motion abnormalities even after rest, after you get ROSC, can be a little gray because sometimes, you know, when you just pounded them with 12 milligrams of epi, any kind of supply demand mismatch can cause a wall, a, you know, a temporary wall motion abnormality. It's, it's, it's a case by case. It's complicated. It can get complicated. Um, the next one I have here is hypovolemia. So, you know, I think it's worth the 10 to 12 seconds to put the probe on the belly and see if you see free fluid. Now, I don't feel like this, you know, for the number of times I've done it, I can only remember one younger person who had a splenic rupture, diagnosis after the fact was splenic rupture, and they had a positive free flask, but uh, positive um, uh, fast and free fluid. That person got resuscitated. It's a very soft, brief code, and that person did all right. But I've never had someone who just came, you know, out of nowhere with a positive free fast and were able to resuscitate. I think it's definitely reasonable to assess. So... <clears throat> Uh, the next one, of course, you could throw the probe uh, on the on the abdomen, and you might see a big triple A. Uh, you might see evidence of rupture. You know that could kind of guide your volume resuscitation um, if you think that's the actual diagnosis. Can also be a little bit challenging to tell in cardiac arrest. So that's kind of our H's and T's in level of confidence. Um, what we're talking about next is how we can correctly diagnose the rhythm. And so I talked about putting the probe on, saving a clip. And in cases where I know definitively I misdiagnosed the rhythm on the ECG leads and was able to correctly diagnose the rhythm on ultrasound. So when we have a patient with this, I think we all know what to do. We defibrillate this patient. No big deal. Uh, pretty straightforward. But sometimes we get this kind of like wavering baseline and everyone's like, eh, like everyone kind of like, it's like, say with the rhythm on three, one, two, three, and you get like three different answers. Uh, so sometimes we're not really sure. And so for example, we might have this ultrasound and a couple things of note, you know, here's the sub xiphoid view. We're seeing very low flow in the right side of the ventricle. We're seeing kind of early clot formation. We're definitely not seeing any kind of obvious organized contraction. And then when we like zoom in, like get real close to that RV free wall, we see this little, and that is 
V-fib. So that patient that we had that kind of wavering baseline, they were in fine V-fib. You can say, you know, we're not going to wait another two minutes. We're just going to shock it now. We, we see the V-fib on ultrasound. We're able to make that diagnosis. Guess what? Full contractility comes back. The patient's surviving. We all high five. Perfect. Now, alternatively, we see a patient with this narrow complex tachycardia. We put the probe on the chest and it can kind of go a couple ways. You know, we can see something like this, uh, like EF negative 10, I think, something very low contractility. And we have to ask ourselves, are we in a state of maybe cardiogenic shock, you know, or, or profound poor cardiac output? Um, and maybe, you know, getting that A line in is going to be a, a priority and pressure titration could kind of fit into that kind of ballpark. Or alternatively, we see that narrow complex um, sinus tack and we see a heart that's kicking really good. In my mind, that kind of raises my suspicion for obstructive shock. You know, is there a PE? Is there a, a pneumothorax that I'm missing? Is it hypovolemia? If I, the heart's still kicking, um, you know, I see that sinus tack as maybe some other kind of reversible cause. Now, alternatively, we see some kind of uh, slow ventricular escape rhythm. Kind of looks like a barbed wire tattoo or something like that. Uh, and then we look at the heart. The heart is, again, in profound um, poor contraction. And, you know, maybe we, again, need to do something like an A-line and pressure titration. Or we see a cardiac standstill, right? And all we have is kind of residual electrical activity without any kind of organized room. So I think we can kind of use com the combination of our lines, our, uh, our lead tracing with the ultrasound to make sure that we're making the right decision and kind of kind of directing our management that direction. So <clears throat> when it comes to correctly diagnosing the rhythm, and I wish it was this easy, uh, but we also see that it takes a little bit of practice. And this was a study out of UPenn that kind of looked at what, what they did was they pulled people with ultrasound experience. They gave them like 32 different images and asked, was there standstill, cardiac activity, or are you going to abstain? So unfortunately, there is a bit of a range in, of people with ultrasound training interpreting the same images. So here, for example, we saw mechanical ventilation valve flutter. And now if you've done ultrasound and cardiac arrest, you probably know what this looks like. You're looking at the heart, it's not doing anything, and then someone bags and you see a little, a little, a little flutter on the uh, mitral valve or something like that. And so we see that somewhere around a third of our respondents with ultrasound training um, said that this was cardiac activity when in fact it's not. So, you know, don't be misled. Other things we saw was that V-fib had a pretty big range. Some people said it was cardiac standstill. Some people said it was cardiac activity. My guess is we see the difference between coarse V-fib, really obvious, and then the, the necessity of trying to pick up that fine V-fib. And so we see a spectrum. Now, lastly, um, weak myocardial contraction, just profound uh, weak myocardial contraction can definitely be interpreted as standstill. So, you know, it takes a little bit of practice. It takes a little bit of image repetition to really uh, make sure you're making the right call. Don't, don't let ultrasound dissuade you if everything else is lining up one way. Um, so what's the prognosis? Kind of our last piece here. And I remember like one of the first studies on this topic said if you had cardiac standstill on ultrasound, 100% not going to make it. And of course, these studies are a little self-fulfilling, right? If you, uh, if you were to make the intervention that this patient is not going to make it based on some finding, uh, that is a self-fulfilling um, prophecy. Now, these were observ this study was observational, and they said, uh, I think around the 100 or so state patients that they found cardiac standstill, none of them had return of spontaneous circulation. So let's also put this in the context of some of the other things we know about cardiac arrest. And that's that um, if you have no ROSC at any time, no bystander CPR, and you've never delivered any kind of shocks, um, you know, we know that that already equals a very high mortality or, or you know, terminal mortality. Um, and those, of course, are called the termination of resuscitation rules. 
Um, and we also know that your initial rhythm, whether it's PEA and asystole versus shockable rhythm, also correlate with different, very different survival rates. So we have a lot of data on how we're supposed to be predicting outcomes in cardiac arrest. So how does ultrasound really factor in? So now in 2022, there's been over 10 studies and a recent meta-analysis of 1,700 total patients. And it doesn't quite add up like that first study did of 100%. So let's go over that a little bit more in more granular data. So this is probably the most important. When you have good cardiac activity, we had a 67% or 60.7% positive outcome. Positive outcome meaning uh, either different studies, but ROSC, survival to admission and survival to discharge, one of those kind of conglomerate um, outcomes. So if you see a heart that's squeezing, there's a decent chance you're going to get something meaningful. And I actually think of all of the next couple of slides, this is probably the most important. And we, of course, see all these studies, they all kind of show this odds ratio in favor of probably continuing uh, resuscitation when you see good cardiac activity. So on the abs in the absence of good cardiac activity, we see uh, 12% negative outcome. Where, where those last like 15% went, I have no idea. But <clears throat> that's good cardiac activity. When you see cardiac standstill, now, like I said, that first study was 100%. Meta-analysis with 1,700 patients put that negative outcome at 94%, meaning no survival to admission, did not survive to discharge, or never got ROSC. <clears throat> so that, you know, in medicine, we do a lot of things for bigger error margins than 6%. So I think that kind of plays into, um, you know, what, else you've already assumed about the patient was the patient not an unwitnessed arrest never received bystander cpr you know all these prognostic factors and they present an asystole then yeah you're probably in that 94 but if you just use it as a single marker ultrasound no cardiac activity you're going to miss somewhere around six percent of your patients that may have had a positive arrest so a lot of this <clears throat> is kind of a back to the basics like how do we approach asystole because asystole is essentially cardiac standstill on ultrasound. Maybe some variation there. Uh, and what do you do with asystole? The moment you see someone in asystole, do you stop resuscitation? Depends, right? It factors into all the other things that we do for cardiac arrest. So <clears throat> that kind of wraps up uh, this lecture on ultrasound and cardiac arrest. Different levels of confidence, a little bit of the data, a discussion about the RV and how we approach that, and of course, um, you know, how we can use it to prognosticate. I'd love to, uh, you know, hear any questions or any, you know, variations on this, how you all do it, something along those lines. Happy to answer any questions. Taryn, that was like amazing, as usual. Um, and as with most things, I feel like we agree 100% on like every like um, these are all important things. Uh, one thing that I'll mention is that one of the things that I really like about looking for a DVT or uh, looking for positive fast, looking for lung sliding even, you can do that actually during chest compressions, and I frequently do. So it, it kind of offloads some of that uh, examination for me. Um, and for uh, what I usually do in, in when people are like pumping on the chest is I'll look just right underneath the clavicle. Um, for B lines, because there's movement, right? So yeah. I can't actually like see if they're sliding or not truly, because there's so much movement on the chest. But I just look for the presence or absence of B lines, uh, because if you have a B line, that means that there's no pneumothorax. And I only look in like that one area because I, I'm not interested in a small apical pneumothorax, right? I just care if About there the is one. any detached lung anywhere, and if there is, and that's not the cause of the patient's arrest. I don't know. There's like not a good way to know that up front. So I, I'm very happy doing a finger thoracostomy followed by a chest tube on those patients. You can yeah. do that all during arrest, by the way. Like putting a chest tube when uh, patients are getting compressions is a little tricky with regards to not stabbing yourself on accident. Um, but it's definitely doable. Um, I don't want to speak for you, Chairman, but I've definitely done it a couple of times. And yeah. it's, I'm yeah. not like the chest tube expert and not being a chest tube expert, I can do it. So like <laughs> yeah. if I can do it, I think that it's something that the vast majority of, of clinicians can do. Yeah, it's definitely not something you need to, all right, everybody stop compressions. I got to do my <laughs> very detailed, no, just get it done. I yeah, think yeah. you're right. Yeah, and that's a good point because, you know, um, 
ideally your code gets a little boring, right? Like, okay, chest compressions, maybe some epi, and then what do you do for two minutes? I'll check your check Instagram, I don't know. But you're right, you can be doing all this other ultrasound stuff while that's going on uh, concurrent with high quality chest compressions. Yeah, no, I uh, 100% agree. I don't and, check uh, my Instagram during cardiac rest, for the record. <laughs> There's know, nothing on it, it anyway. It's so boring sometimes. Yeah, um, it's nothing. No, on. no, but but it, it's all about uh, minimizing time off the chest, um, and that's an important thing. I'm, um, yeah, uh, that's mean another thing that I feel kind of like strongly about is is 10 seconds being 10 seconds, mm-hmm. just because there's just a couple of articles, unfortunately, that that mention that ultrasound is associated with delays in, in chest compression or in uh, or prolongation of pulse checks. Um, yep. And I guess, like, I understand the thought. Like, I get that that could happen. But also, like, come on, like, 10 seconds is 10 seconds. If you don't get your view within those 10 seconds, you're not going to get a view. And in fact, like, I know that there's – and I, I, I'm blanking on the exact study, but there was a non-arrest study, basically, that saw – that if you can't get the view within like the first few seconds, the chance of you getting a good view just in general is pretty poor. So mm. like doing little adjustments is not going to like fix anything. It's not going to make you get a better view. Um, and what I usually do is I have uh, whoever's keeping track of time for the pulse check. I have them count down like a timer from 10 to zero. And then when they get to two, um, I'm off the chest. So I basically have eight seconds to get the view because I do not want, the ultrasound to be associated. I don't want to be the person who prolongs those pulse checks. Yeah. Remember the ultrasound doesn't have a brain. It doesn't have like, it's a personality. It's only going to do what you tell it to do. So really it's not that ultrasound is associated with cardiac arrest. It's, and I say this respectfully, um, as respectfully as I can, it's, there are people that prolong cardiac arrest. That's the right. ultrasound machine is just, I don't know. Like it's, it's there doing whatever you tell it to do. Um, it's just yeah. a tool. It's a tool. That's right. In your quiver. That's, That's right. right. Thank you, Taryn. Thank you for the setup <laughs> for that. It's also an arrow in your toolbox also. <laughs> um, I, I could talk a lot more about this. Um, does anybody else have any questions, comments, or thoughts? Because I, I definitely have a lot more. Yeah. And please, anyone inter- interrupt. Um, there was a study in with ultrasound and cardiac arrest that does not show up mortality benefit. And I don't care. Do you care, Jacob? I don't care. No, it's more data. Like, why do I not want more data? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, to study anything at minute 19 of cardiac arrest and expect a uh, major impact in mortality would require a very well-powered study, you know. I think they were looking for like a a billion patients. Yeah, they were looking for like like, every cardiac arrest in the world for five years. Yeah. (laughs) Difference. Yeah. Yeah, and the... I don't know. And the other thing is, is that, you know, that 4% that you're talking about, like that 4% actually like had a decent outcome and they had standstill. Um, that's something too, that you could like argue both ways. Like for me, okay. that actually is a reminder that it's a tool, you know, mm-hmm. it's not, it's not the only thing. Um, on the flip side, you can say like, well, if there's, you know, 6% chance, like why even look like, what's the point? But I don't know. Like, I just feel like if there's that case that there's a patient that's been down, I mean, I, I, we, I've been there. I'm, I know you have Taryn where you have this patient that's been down for 30 minutes and you're like, Ugh, I don't know. And then you look and they have actually some cardiac activity. Mm-hmm. Um, I've actually prolonged the CPR past what, without the ultrasound, I wouldn't have, you know, I would have stopped already. I yeah. have the ultrasound. And I see some cardiac activity. I'm like, you know what? Let's start an epi drip. Let's see. And the patient, I mean, survives, to admission, you know, and there's, yeah. there is, uh, the outcome of survival to admission. And then there's the outcome of good Neuro- neurologic outcome yeah. down the road. Um, and that, that is more sparse. Yeah. And my my the, opinion is, you know, get them to that point and allow neuroprognostication to occur. And, you know, maybe it's even, there's, there's a long commentary, but you know, neuroprognostication takes three days by most guidelines. And maybe that oh, even wow. helps the family, you know, I don't know, maybe. I don't know, yeah. but there's also so I like to get them to get those admin orders and let whatever half happens after that. I that's my opinion, of course. Yeah, no, I'm I'm on board with that. And the last thought with regards to that six you know, percent and the you know doesn't has not been shown to change mortality off of you know uh, really I mean Single. essentially an underpowered study. Yeah, um, is this thought the thought is that 
let's say that there's a hundred people that come into the ER with the exact same arrest scenario and you diagnose attention pneumothorax, you diagnose tamponade in one of those patients. That's like, you know, it's a 1% favorable outcome. Yeah. But like to that human with a family, that is a very important outcome based off of something that you can do without like taking away from anything else. Like Nailed that it. 1% of people survived yeah. when they wouldn't have survived. And to me, that's worth it. Like just that totally. one case that's worth using this thing. Yeah. It's almost it, uh, doing these big studies. It's almost, I don't know. It's, I, 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 sometimes I feel like the anecdotal evidence in this is actually more important. I know that's not, you know, the stats yeah. behind me is about to stab me, but, um, but I, <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. And I think that's, it's within our skill set and our capabilities to make that happen. I mean, UK sees something like 350 arrests a year. So, Same. you know, <laughs> yeah, that's a decent you, number of people. Chicken and waffles. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's actually kind of crazy. I'm in, uh, you know, I'm in Southern California now <clears throat> and we're not like super healthy, but the amount of arrests I'm seeing here versus the amount of arrests I saw UK was, it's, it's a bit different. I mean, it's not as much as it was there. And, I mean, I know that UK is a huge, you know, referral center and that might be part of it. But yeah, we, uh, Taryn, we were there like together, at least like we saw sh a lot of arrests. And yeah. I think that helps us with the perspective of this is helpful in the right situation. That's right. Sick. Does anybody else have any questions or comments? Taryn, any, uh, any final thoughts? I don't think so. Send me your wall motion out, Mal. <laughs> yeah, no, I will. I, I, I've, I've had two. I'd like to see those case. Here. I'd like to see the whole how the whole case plays out. Yeah, I've actually like you know because we have that uh, the cloud, the butterfly cloud mm -hmm. that uh, people can look them up on their phone. So I'll just like have it on my phone, and be like, look, and I shove it in their face, and they're like, oh, yeah, but maybe I'm like, I know, but they were found down. They had good, um, you know, time and chest compressions, yeah. and look, and they're like, <laughs> okay, and they take them up and. I, I think I've had about a 50% success rate with like survival, which sounds bad, but for someone who's arresting for like 30 minutes, that's, that's not, not bad. bad. Like that's really good actually. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like what is the survival? I, I think I remember seeing a quote that it was like 4% of uh, all cardiac arrests uh, survive like to good, favorable neurologic outcome. Yeah. So I think 50%. All right. Well, right on. Uh, great to see you again. Terrence, thank you so much stoked. for having me yeah and thanks so much for uh, for for learning us ultrasound and cardiac arrest is so important it's so important to utilize it correctly and in the right clinical setting i hope that was helpful if you want to know more about ultrasound leadership academy just head over to ultrasoundleadershipacademy.com